wrestling is utterly ridiculous. <laughs> we only just had one pay-per-view and you wake up and the following week and you're like, why? We have another pay-per-view this weekend. And I know you're saying, Simon, what the hell was that noise that just came out of your mouth? Not gonna lie, I didn't expect it either. Hello, yes, my name is Simon from What Culture. Thank goodness I was born with that and Raw did just have the go-home show for Survivor Series, even though technically SmackDown is the go-home show, but who the hell cares? Not I. Let us take the finger of power of the fop and sometimes we'll point to the ceiling and sometimes we'll point to the floor and that is positive and that is negative. It's ups and downs. <laughs> Kevin Owens was out to start Raw this week, and while WWE is obsessed with the opening show promo, we haven't seen him in so long, I was happy he was here. He talked about why he joined the War Games Good Guy team, and it was all like, look, you probably think it's because of Sami Zayn, because Sami Zayn and I are tied at the hip, but it's nothing to do with him, it's to do with another human being, a certain head of the table, I'm going after Roman Reigns, ah yeah. Now this was mostly down to all the nonsense that happened a couple of years ago, because as KO said, if it wasn't for the bloodline, maybe I would be the champion right now. So I think I've waited long enough, it's time to kick some tribal ass. This is exactly how it should be too, multiple people gunning for Roman, because he is the double champ. And then Kevin proved he's a very nice individual, because he was like, do you know how I got on SmackDown? I was invited, so I wanted to return the favor. Conductor hands, so who came out the brawling brutes and Drew McIntyre. So that is quite the party, and it had a massive love in, which is fine by me. And you just knew that somebody was going to erupt, but I didn't call this one. It was the judgment day. Huh. Rhea Ripley led the charge and even said, Shut up, Drew McIntyre. So she's the absolute best, because no one's going to give a flub what anybody else does at the pay per view premium live event, because everyone's just going to be talking about the destruction that Rhea brings. I actually said out loud, yeah, do that, do that. Ripley should be every single champion there is. Damien Priest joined in after a little while when Dominic pretended he was this tough guy and he just got booed the hell out of him. I can't lie, Dommy Boy gets better every single week. I mean, he's just such a massive piece of shit. Finn Balor also took some shots at AJ Styles when Sheamus took over and basically went, hey Finn, you're Irish, I'm Irish, but I'm utterly ashamed of you and you do nothing for our country. It was quite mean. It was all setting up a big six man tag, but I tell you, I am so pumped for war games on both the men and women's side, because I think given it is the first time it's on the main roster, WWE are gonna do some crazy things and they planted the seeds here. I am giving it up. And then yeah, it was time for Damian Priest, Finn Balor and Dominic Mysterio to take on the brawling brutes. The best part was Kevin Owens was on commentary and he was like, you know what? I've turned on a lot of people in my life, but I'd never turn on Terry, who is my father, unlike that little sniveling coward Dominic. The happiest man alive. This was all about Dom too, because he got mecha heat every single time he was in the ring, until he realized, oh no, I've got to go up against Sheamus. So he decided to leg it. He's so damn entertaining. The problem from him is that the OC were clearly watching and they chased him back into the ring. Obviously the tag klaxon went off then because everybody was fighting everybody else because everybody in this does hate everybody else. When Dom realized, wait a minute, Sheamus is right there. Why don't I hit him with the most devastating move in all the spots entertainment, the surprise roll up. And he was this close to winning and he didn't. Because of course the Irishman just got up and beat the absolute piss out of Mysterio. Hit him with the bro kick, one, two, three. But somehow all of this worked to build every single person up, even though we did have some losers, like the Judgment Day, and never really on the L side, but it didn't matter at all. So this is good professional wrestling booking. Give it a nap. There was even more scrapping afterwards with the good guy standing tall to get that message in your head. So you're just nice and simple is what this was. You don't always need to reinvent the wheel. Just put it on the car and roll it downhill. We had a chat with Johnny Gargano after this, who basically said he was going to head out to the ring to fight The Miz, which he did do, when the A-lister arrived and was all like, oh, well, it would be great to have a fight with you, Jonathan, but I'm not going to do that because I've hurt my hand making a TikTok video with cacti. I kind of looked around the place like, what the flub is going on? This meant he had found a replacement for himself. So our next match was Johnny Gargano 
versus Omos. Now look, I love Omos and I think he does what he has to do well, very, very well, and he's a good big man. But in no world did I feel like I needed to see this match. And you've already figured out what did happen here. The Miz kind of interfered. He kind of cast distraction. When Gargano like fell off the rope <laughs> into Omos's hand, he gave him the big slam and he beat him for the one, two, three. And I just stared off into the abyss because I couldn't believe this had happened. I just think we've got to the point where we do need to draw a line under the Miz versus Dexter Loomis, and I do believe that's happening at the Survivor Series. And also, this has to be an extra one on the distraction counter. Like, it wasn't the most obvious distraction, but there was quite clear interference. So I really don't know who this benefited, and it didn't move the story on at all. Also, where the flubber's Omos been ever since he lost to Braun Strowman? You gotta give it a down. Seth Rollins was then backstage talking to us all on a microphone about Survivor Series when he told us, <laughs> I am now going to be taking on Bobby Lashley and Austin Theory for my United States Championship. But don't worry, don't freak out. This was my idea. I've got a plan. He also didn't blame Theory for trying to cash in his Money in the Bank briefcase because he gets it. But he still thinks he's an idiot and maybe he should call up Cody Rhodes and ask how his rehab is going. So I just fell on the floor at this point, had to get myself back up again, because I was like, wait a minute, I thought Seth Rollins was meant to be a good guy now, but going off this promo, he was an absolute dick. But even more confusing, so we then cut to Austin Theory, who's now in his super serious mode, oh, you can't beat me. And he kind of cut a promo where I was like, well, this more edgy, not Adam Copeland side, to Theory almost makes him a good guy. I don't understand what happened in the last five minutes. He also told Bobby Lashley and Rollins to watch him next. He was going to have a match with Mustafa Ali. That made me laugh. It was a bit like he was going, please be impressed with me and witness what I can do in the ring. But something is happening here. I don't think we mentioned Cody Rhodes' name for the fun of it. And we clearly have a new direction for Austin Theory. And as for Seth Rollins, <laughs> no idea. This is Seth Rollins. He's just doing some kind of a dance. I think he's a great professional wrestler and I do like his character. I just have no idea whether I'm meant to support him or whether I want to throw him down a well. So given that it did get me intrigued, I am going to get an up. I'm a slightly confused. And then we had a quandary because it was Theory versus Ali in a match that I dubbed, well, nobody should lose this because it's not the time for them to lose. Stuff for Ali lost. They only got five minutes too, which was a little bit of a shame because I think if they had a little bit longer, it would have been a right banger. Although they still got a lot done. Like at one point, Ali hit his perfect super kick when Austin Theory went for that roll drop kick thingamajig that he does. And Ali was able to hit like a sunset flip, what you would call it. And he hit a 450. And just as he was about to pin Austin, Theory was like, nah, it's not happening. And he rolled out of the ring. It meant Mustafa had to go and get him though. And by that point, Theory must have taken a Phoenix down because he recovered. He threw Mustafa right into Barry Barricade. And then he put him back in the squared circle. He even shouted, oh, down, down. Because why wouldn't you tell your opponent you're about to do your finisher? Although it didn't hurt him, he did smack it. One, two, three. So this felt far easier than it should have been. Although I do understand the whole point here. We are trying to rebuild Austin Theory as a genuine threat. And I do think that's smart. And I quite like it. So I am going to give it an up. But Mustafa Ali, even with his broken tape ribs, which was the excuse why he did lose, he is just getting defeated after defeated after defeated after defeated. And I think we're taking a step too far with it now. Because he is really good and could be utilized in championship pictures. That would make any sense. Point is, it's getting it down. Bobby Lashley also appeared on the big screen after this and went, hey, Austin, up here. And then he walked to the ring anyway. So that was a waste of time. When these two got into it, and this ties into the previous down, because Bob absolutely wrecked him. At one point, Theory hit him with a chair. And Lashley was like, oh, why did you do that? What a waste of time. Although I love that spot. No selling stuff is the best thing in the world. But then they fought backstage. Ali was there being like, oh, my ribs, my bit of cotton didn't work to protect me. So Theory pushed him into Lashley. And that pissed Lashley off so much, he threw him into the stage, he threw him into the LED boards, and he put him in the hurt lock until Mustafa Ali passed out. So I don't know what Mustafa Ali did, but he must have pissed somebody off. We then followed up on what we did on Raw last week, which is always nice, because there was a time we didn't do that. 
and it was Elias and Riddle taking on the Alpha Academy. Now it probably was a little long and you could have chopped a few minutes off, but forget about that, because I thought this was truly fun. Like Elias just gets his character, he knows what to do. Otis is an absolute laugh riot and a hoot, he always has good things in his back pocket. And Chad Gable and Matthew Riddle could fight until the end of time and they'd still somehow be able to come up with something new. And at one point they were fighting on the ring apron, which is the hardest part of the ring. And Chad Gable gave Riddle a German suplex. That is the Schwergister Tell Death Rings. It was also a great near fall after Riddle broke up a Chad Gable diving headbutt. And when he got the hot tag here, he went absolutely crazy. And he took out the whole Alpha Academy with a dive, and then he reversed the Chaos Theory attempt into this massive knee. Could say what you like about Riddle, but you can't say he's a bad wrestler. I think we wanted to make sure we tried to get everybody over here too, because it was wrestling tennis as they did go back and forth. And then when we got to the finish, yeah, Elias hit his drift away. <laughs> And then he tagged Riddle, who was already on the top rope. And the ref went, yeah, I think that's fine. Well, I'm sorry, referee, that it's not a legal tag. But Matthew then hit the floating bro, and he pitched Chad Gable for the one, two, three. Now, at first, I was like, wait a minute. We just had a non-established tag team beat an established tag team. And Alpha Academy had been very good recently. But I think we should stick with Elias and Riddle. I thought this was quite entertaining, and the match itself was great. I'm gonna give it an up. Drew McIntyre then found Baron Corbin and JBL backstage. He insulted them, he yelled at them. We got into a little bit of a fight when we were told that next up it was gonna be Drew McIntyre versus Baron Corbin. And if you're confused about that, don't worry. I went and did my digging and I figured it out. Ever wonder why a man would quite clearly kneel down on one knee and wear a hood and a hat simultaneously? Well, much like professional wrestling, in life, sometimes stuff just happens. So if you're trying to figure out why from nowhere WWE did Drew McIntyre versus Baron Corbin, which was a WrestleMania rematch and didn't advertise it at all, please give us a call at 0800 Stuff Just Happens. And we're here for you and we always understand. So that's right, sometimes stuff just happens, although they did go to the squared circle and they had about 20 minutes, so they got some serious time. And while this was some hard hitting action, I will tell you this. I could have tried to guess the finish from now till 2067, and I don't think I ever would have come up with it. Now Baron did hit a superplex during this, which is kind of crazy because they are both big men, which was the same when McIntyre absolutely wrecked him with a spine buster and followed it up with a choke slam. They were certainly putting in the effort. Baron then dodged the Claymore and he was able to hit a Samoan drop, but realizing Drew was like a superhero, he also threw him into Rita the Ring Post and he threw him into Ali the Announce Table. But I suppose JBL at this point was still a little bit worried because he started going around going, ha ha, distraction, ha ha, distraction. I mean, that is why he's there. He allowed Corbin to hit the deep six, and while I don't think that move has ever actually won a match, it did get me intrigued because I was like, okay, we're going somewhere. When, yeah, <laughs> he got the most crazy ending ever, although I suppose it did tie in to what happened seven days ago. Because from nowhere, Tazawa teleported in, he was wearing his old ring gear, he saw Bradshaw, he stole Bradshaw's hat, and this freaked Baron Corbin out so much, he totally forgot he was in a wrestling match, he was like, no, you must give his hat device back to him. When he turned around, he got claymored, uno dos tres. This was really weird. And the reason for that is because I'm totally torn. On the one hand, here it is, I am so happy that we've repackaged his hour and maybe we're gonna give him a proper push because he is so talented. But on the other, Baron Corbin has only just had his repackaging. I don't think he should be losing to anyone, especially Drew McIntyre, who beat him at WrestleMania. It means I'm going to be that guy because I was so pumped for Tazawa that I'm going to give it an up, but I'm going to give it a down because, yeah, I just don't think Corbin should be losing, much like Johnny Gargano and much like Mustafa Ali. Hopefully it does build to some kind of change up when Baron Corbin comes back and he's all aggressive and mad like he was down in NXT. Oh, sorry, bring it back. There it is. The distraction counter keeps on rolling up. At this stage, it's basically out of control. WWE does too many of them. We were then backstage with the OC when AJ Styles told Finn Balor that he was a Schmeril, so the Judgment Day did turn up. And they had this massive brawl, 
that ended in the parking lot when Carl Anderson grabbed Dominic Mysterio and threw him into a car. So once again, I was just going, ha, 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 like I was some kind of end of level boss in a video game. Because Dominic Mysterio is the glue that holds us all together, even though most of the time, he just getting his ass kicked. This is when WWE made a massive error too, because out came Bianca Belair, Alexa Bliss and Oscar. And of course, we know that Mia Yim is their fourth person on their War Games team, don't know where she was, but we don't know who number five is. So Bianca went, well, I'm so happy to announce, I'll tell you on SmackDown. And what did everybody do? Boo! That was so dumb. It was so stupid. You gotta give it a down. Damage Control, Nikki Cross and Rhea Ripley soon joined them because of course they are a fully formed unit. And that's when I started to get really excited because Rhea was like, Oscar, I think you're an idiot. And Oscar was like, well, hi, I think you're a moron too. Why don't we have a wrestling match? And I started to do a dance. I wanted it. It then turned out that this was going to be our main event and whoever did win would have had the advantage going into war games. And they just kicked each other's ass. And I tell you this, it was flubbing great. I mean, Oscar hit this crazy hip attack so Rhea grabbed her by the hair and clubbed her like she was a piñata. And that's when they went into the submission game, which is you do a submission, I'll do a submission. You do a submission, I'll do a submission. Wait a minute, none of these submissions are working. Punch each other in the face. Rhea quite literally shoved Oscar's skull into the mat at 1.2, which was horrible. Although when they were on the outside, she ran at the Empress of Tomorrow, Oscar moved, and Ripley went flying into Rita. It was an opening for Oscar, who just lit her up because she hit a code breaker, she hit this kick, and she hit this wonderful German suplex. Danke schön. Oscar then grabbed Ripley off the top and hit her with this knee so hard I think I died. But I think it must have annoyed Rhea because he was like, right, that's it. I am going to hit you with every single variation of a suplex that I know. She went for the riptide, but Oscar was able to reverse that into this arm bar thing. When all of a sudden, the damage control was like, oh, okay, we're going to go out now. I was like, why now? Why at this second? Why have you decided this is the juncture? What have you been doing for 10 minutes? And of course, out came Alexa Bliss and Bianca Belair and Mia Yim, I think, joined in as well. And it's just so strange when they do do this, especially because it triggered a massive brawl. It was actually quite smart though, because it made you go, oh man, well someone's just gonna win by distraction. That wasn't true though, because we moved past that. And after Oscar and Rhea Ripley had gone at it for a little bit, Ripley was able to avoid Oscar. She hit the Riptide and she pinned her. I thought that was pretty damn clean. It also means the bad guys now do have the extra person's advantage when it comes to war games, and it always makes sense like that, and we've already talked about that today. Making sense is good. This is getting a very powerful up. And the aftermath was fun too, because Mia Yim did definitely join in at this point, and everybody was fighting everybody else, and at one point Oscar did this massive dive and took out the entire field, including her friends, but I suppose it is 2022, and needs must. And if you want to be like a pernickety Pete, I do agree with you. We had a whole war games team and we only had four. Why didn't the bad guys take the advantage here? I mean, Raw kind of just went off the air, but I don't care about stuff like that. Mostly because I thought it was fun. I'm also now totally convinced that we are going to get two amazing war games when we do get to Saturday night. But yes, put my hands in the air. This was absolutely an uneven Raw. Some of the stuff they did away from war games was probably, properly baffling. Although we'll have to wait and see. But overall, I shall give it up. Now please do leave a comment below and let me know what you thought about last night's episode of Raw. Like the video, share the video, and subscribe. And you know the deal. WhatCulture.com, social media, come follow us. And there's so many ups and downs. You've got AEW, you've got WWE. Just go watch them so I can feel like my life isn't a waste of time. And also for what culture, thank you very much for always supporting me and engaging me and liking the video and commenting. It makes me feel all warm and fuzzy in my tum-tum. I will see you soon.